So welcome to another class on the brain spaces. And today we, we're going to talk about the relation that um, the Burns found out between um, um, his theory of the Burns, as you know, he didn't call it the Burns spaces, but his theory of Hubert spaces of entire functions and um, and the Riemann zeta function, and more specifically the Riemann hypothesis. So, uh, not gonna um, like try to um, let's say. Uh, with a bad stamp in, in his result, but he has some interesting uh, results regarding uh, an analogous, let's say, uh, uh, um, human hypothesis for Hubert spaces of entire functions. It turns out that it doesn't apply to the zeta function and possibly to other L functions as well, but nevertheless, this is a very interesting result. So we we'll start uh, the class with the result, which we have already the baggage to um, to understand. So that would be what? What's the number of that theorem? Let's let's see what's the previous one. Yeah, it should be some number. Well, let me not name it now. Theorem. It should be some letter but I don't know what the previous one was. Theorem is something, I can feel it later. Okay, so this was, uh, so we'll basically be using the Bruins pa paper of 1986, which is called uh, the human hypothesis for uh, Hubert spaces of entire functions, I guess. And also uh, the Conway and Lee paper about uh, the veil of applying this, um, this, this, this theorem that I'll do here right now to the zeta function. Um, I will probably put the, the, the references in the end, but anyway, put the reference in the end. Okay, so what's the result? So let, so let E be a Hermit Miller function so a function that defines a, a Hubert space of entire function, the Bern space, and assume also that is of Poya class, okay? So the Poya class, we call that a Poya class is uh, a function that, so this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. If you go in this direction, the function is non-decreasing. And also if you take a point here and its reflection, over the real axis, then the function here is in model lines greater or equal than the function here. And also the function doesn't have any zeros down below. That's the Poya class. Uh, in particular, you will have the same uh, hermit dealer condition, which is the value here greater or equal than the value there. Um, but since I'm asking hermit dealer, and this is a strict, okay? So but we will need the property that the function is non decreasing in this direction. And when you have uh, this strict condition here, uh, you will see it's part of some problem in the book I would mention that you actually have that the function is strictly increasing in this, in this direction. But anyway, suppose you have a unique to the function, which is also a Poya class. Um, and no real zeros. Great. So assume that you have a certain function on the W, which is the following. Oops. When you take star, you actually get Z minus I. Okay. And assume also that the map, the maps um, f of z to f of z plus i, 
satisfies that the real part of Tf f is greater or equal than zero for every f in the space where the map is well defined. That is, for every f such that T of f belongs also to the space. So one way of saying this is to define the domain of your uh, the operator T is exactly this, as the functions F in H, such that F of Z plus I is in H. And then on this domain, the operator is well-defined. So maybe it's not a operator defined everywhere. Maybe it's not even densely defined. It's just defined in a certain subspace. Okay, and you have this very important property. I'm um, sorry, one question. Yes. Uh, the scalar product refers to the scalar product in the De Bruijn space, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, so, so this in the literature is called an accretive um, operator when you have something like this. Um, an analogous, so if T was densely defined, um, then this would be more or less equivalent to say that T plus T star is a non-negative operator. Because when you take the real part here, it's basically doing this plus uh, the inner product conjugate, but then you can flip since it's uh, you're emitting in a product. So then you, and then you pass the adjoint to the other side and then you get exactly this. So, uh, so if it was densely defined, you could define the adjoint because usually the, ad, the adjoint can only be defined if your operator is densely defined in the space. And if you can't define, then it's the same to say this. Um, okay, so you suppose that this translation operator that takes this translate your function by i, so in the uh, vertical direction, is a accretive. Okay. And what is the conclusion? Then all zeros of E lie in the line. imaginary part of Z equals minus a half. And moreover, if, if T is strict, so let me use a, a strictly accurate, let's say. Let me, let me write phrasing like that. Moreover, if the real part of TFF is greater than zero uh, if F belongs to the domain of T and it's not zero. Oops, sorry. Get some dust here. Okay, sorry. So if it's strictly positive whenever the function is non-zero, then all the zeros are also simple. Okay. Yes. So Great, so when you see this result, you think, well, okay, there's something nice going on here because we just show that the zeros of a certain function is in a line, okay? So what's the picture here? 
So what's the picture here? So you have, you have here the x-axis. So this is x and this is y. And this is the zero and this is the point minus i. And what we are claiming is that all the zeros are in this line here, right in the middle. This is minus i over two. Um, if you have, so basically he wanted to translate the property of alignment of zeros into something about an operator. And this is not a new idea. This is an idea that goes back to Hilbert and Poyle we have to, to, to show that the zeros of the Riemann zeta function were the eigenvalues of a certain uh, no negative operator, or in some way would relate it with a property of a certain operator in a certain Hilbert space that would naturally force them to be aligned. And in that sense, that's what was, was the branch was after. I mean, okay, uh, he had some other ideas. If you read the paper um, uh, for the interpretation of this result, but that is more or less the feeling. Um, and before we show it, let me just make a remark. The first remark would be, well, this condition here, this functional equation, which you will see will resemble the functional equation for L functions. Once you have, you do a proper rotation of the, of this picture here on the right, um, if you have this equation in a, I, so what you see is that if W say, another way of writing this is, is that for instance. So if you have a zero W, okay, uh, of your function, then well, it must be a zero of this, But that's the same to say that W bar minus I is a zero of E. So equals zero. So then you see that the zeros have this nice property. If W is a zero, then W bar minus I is a zero. So, so what you realize is that if you have a zero, then you conjugate it and then you subtract i, go back down, can you also have a zero? So that would tell you that you can't, all the, first, that would tell you that all the zeros are in here. Because when you conjugate it and, and go below, you have to end up being a zero again. So the only way it's, is, is, is for the zero to be here, to be locked in this, in this place here. And also, since, uh, oh, because, well, because the function doesn't have zeros above, that's one of the, the, the conditions. So that would lock the zeros to be in here. And also, um, and also, since you don't have real zeros, the points in here that you would conjugate and subtract one would end up being a real zero. So you don't have zeros in here in this line here above. So it's very similar to the conditions of the theta function. So the zeros of E are all contained in the space imaginary part of Z between uh, minus one and zero. So you can only have zeros in here. And we are saying that all of them are actually aligned if you have some condition in the space that the function E generates. Any questions here so far? Good. Great, so let's see the proof. The proof is not that complicated, um, uh, but it, it has some, uh, 
technicalities. Okay, so let me first recall the reproducing kernel of the space. So that's the reproducing kernel. You should know by heart by now since you're doing so many problems. There is the version with the A functions, but I, don't want, I will not use that. Um, so, so let's, so if W is a zero, okay, if W is a zero of E, then what do we know? Then KW, uh, let's say Z plus I is what? Well, this bit here will vanish. So we only have something in here, but by the equation, this is just E of Z. So this would be minus E of Z. And in there we will have just E star of W conjugate, but we also know that this is equal to uh, E W minus I, so this would just be E W minus I conjugate divided by two pi I W bar minus Z. Okay. But then I can uh, multiply and divide by E W pull. Oh, sorry, there was something here as well because I put that Z plus I. So it should be minus Z minus I, okay? So what I can do is, well, I see that I can put these two guys together, multiply and divide. So let me do that. So D will be E of Z plus I, and then divide by two pi I, W plus I bar minus Z, and then I have to multiply by E W minus I bar divided by E W plus I bar. And, you, and I will show in a moment that these, these two numbers here, they are not zero. Okay, they, are, they can't be zero by, by the remark I just said, because with W is a zero, that's the assumption. Then W plus, W is a point here, then W plus I will be a point in here. So definitely not a zero of E. So definitely this is not zero. And similarly, if it's in here, then W minus I will be a point in here. So not a zero. So these quantities are not zero, so I can multiply, divide. Okay. And then what is that here? Well, that here is exactly minus K of W plus I Z by the formula here. And then you have this factor. Okay, so what I showed was, <coughs> sorry. So what I showed was something nice. I showed that when W is a zero of E, oh, yeah, perhaps I forgot to say that, I should say, uh, the space cannot be trivial in the sense that uh, E must have a zero below. Okay, so I should say that they should include here no V of zeros. And this is at least one. Uh, I should say that E has at least one zero. Okay, otherwise the whole argument would be uh, empty because I would need no zeros, okay. So what I did here was just show that, well, this function here, so what I did here was just show that KWZ belongs to the domain of the operator if it's a zero of W. That's what we did, okay.
because, well, if you translate by plus i, it's just a function in the space because this is a function in the space. Okay, good. Let me go to the next step. Okay, so I already know that, okay, at least I have uh, some functions in the domain. So what I can do, so now let me define a new unit product, which to be really different, I will denote it like this. Okay, so that would be the unit product of Z plus I, so T operated in F times G plus uh, the adjoint of it. So that f of z, g of z plus i. Okay, and what I do know, so now define, move this to a little bit. So now you find this guy and note that this is a proper inner product because by the condition of the result, this is just the real part of f of z plus i, the condition of the, the theorem. This is this, and this is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so we have a proper inner product. And that will be useful because I will use the cauchy schwartz inequality associated with that inner product to prove something, okay? And so what would be the cauchy schwartz inequality? So the cauchy schwartz inequality says what? It says that if I do f g, squared, that would be less or equal than FF GG, okay? And this is already cool because um, you have some, some property about the Brown space and then you're using the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality to prove a pro property about the zero. It's already some cool stuff. Okay, so I do have that. What I do next? Well, next, I want to know what is F computed against. So, okay, obviously, now define, I forgot to say, for F and G in the domain of T. Okay, otherwise I can't define those things, of course. So I'm only defining this inner product in there. Um, so, but I do know that KWZ belongs to the domain. So maybe I will have to, so what it is, so now let's compute what? Uh, let's compute F with KWZ, okay? Where is it? For W a zero of E, let's compute that. And F in the domain of T, of course, Let's compute that, okay? Well, what is that? Well, that is F Z plus I, K of W Z plus F of Z, K of W Z plus I, okay? The first bit we know how to compute because it's just the evaluation. So this is just W plus I. And the second bit, we, we don't really know what it is, but we have an identity for this function here, which is this one here. This identity, this guy equals this. So we replace this, this function by this. And when I replace it, we have this factor coming out and then we have just the reproducing kernel, but now at W plus I. So that, that would mean just, it's just evaluation at W plus I. So if I input this, uh, identity here, I will get just one minus W I W plus I. And it will get uh, conjugated uh, because in here I have this thing, but this function here is on the right of the inner product. So this 
constant here will come out as the conjugate. So that's why we get exactly this. So good, this is a, a good computation. So this new linear product tells you that in this new subspace, the domain of T, this, this, this guy here works as a reproducing kernel because it's basically just giving me the value at W plus I, but only if W is a zero, okay? So it's kind of a, a good property. Okay, so now let's use that, that computation. So we do know now that applying the the uh, cauchy schwarz inequality, we have that this times one minus w minus i w plus i squared would be less or equal than f f, which I don't care for the moment, and then um, and then. Um, the it should be k w z k w z okay um, and of course I still assume that w is a zero so but to compute this we can just use the previous formula where it will be just the case of replacing this f by the k that would be, I would be putting here just K of W, W plus I, okay? But then I can use the identity I had before because this guy will multiply with this constant one, but also with this. And then the identity I had before, which was this one here, uh, can be used again. So you can show that this thing here is just F, F, and it is just um, k w w plus i plus k w plus i w. Okay, you have this reflection thing. And another way of writing this stuff here is just two times the real part of k w w plus i. Just keep that in mind. Recall that the reproducing kernel has the property that kwz bar equals kzw. Okay. So again, this is, there's a calculation to be made here, but it's straightforward coming from the identity for the kernel. Great. Now we will do certain assumptions. So the first assumption is, suppose that kw, w plus i is non-zero. Okay, so if that is the case, then I won't even need that identity I derived before. That would be used only in the second case. But in here is easy to guess what happens because if I just put kw, um, w plus i, what it should be. Well, it should be exactly what we computed before, which was e star of z, and you know, we computed here where it is, right here. So let me copy that. Because it will be exactly this for z equals, uh, z equals a w. Let me do it here. will be this for z equals w, okay? Okay, so I'm assuming that this is non-zero, but then you see already there is a problem because if I evaluate the w, this thing will vanish and then this thing will make that zero. Since I'm assuming it's not zero, it must be the case that the denominator also vanishes, okay? So since this is equal to that, then it must be the case that uh, W bar minus I equals W. That's the only case 
that this gives something non-zero, and it's a necessary condition for this giving something not zero. So that's exactly to say, or equivalently, the imaginary part of W equals minus a half. Okay. But that case is simple. I mean, it's a simple deduction that if this quantity is non-zero, then the zero must be in the line we want. And in this case, uh, we can evaluate what this would be. We have to take a derivative there, and then we'll be exactly e prime w, e w minus i divided by two pi i. Because it, well, if we reverse the sign, there would be the z minus, uh, let's say w, and evaluate when z equals uh, w, so that would exactly take the derivative of that function. Okay. In particular, what we can do is, you know, put in parentheses here, that if that is true, well, we do know that, and you recall that, so this bit here is the real part of that, that number. And we do know that this is a proper inner product. So this quantity here is greater or equal to zero, correct? So that guy here, which is equal to this, has to be greater or equal than zero. So if I take the real part of this number here on the left of this guy, I should get the greater or equal than zero quantity. But that by this identity is the same as to do this. So whenever the zero is on the line, I get that this thing should be true. Okay. So keep that in mind. But that will be important uh, after the theorem. So whenever we have a zero in the line, uh, by this by this identity here, I mean this identity here, since the zero is on the line, we must get this, and therefore. By the condition of the theorem, this has to be greater or equal to zero. Great. So now let's use the Cauchy Schwartz inequality we derived before, which is the condition that if this guy is zero, well, if this guy is zero, since this bit here is just the real part of that guy, so this whole bit here is zero. That means that this thing here is zero. Okay, and I want to deduce that if this thing is zero, then it must be the case that this guy here has to be zero because my claim is that there is some function f in the domain of t so that this thing is not zero. Okay. So, well, I'll pick say f in the domain of t, which we know we, we have because kwz is in the domain if w is a zero and we have at least one zero of it. So f could be even that guy. So just pick one guy, non-zero. And just define, let's say, f tilde of z equals f of z divided by, let's say z, um, I have to divide by w i, so I can, uh, see, I want to remove the zero. So this guy cannot have a zero at w. So then I do this to a certain power m, but then I have to go back. So replace z by z minus i, so it should be w minus i to the power m, f of z. So pick a guy defining this if f at w plus i is zero uh, and of order m. Okay, so remove the zero, okay? That function is on the space, as we know that is the property we saw about burn spaces again. Whenever you have a function in the space and you have a zero of the function, 
then you can cut that zero as long as a non-real zero. And it is a non-real zero because all the zeros of E, again, I'm assuming that W is a zero of E. All the zeros of E are um, uh, a non-real. So therefore I can do that. So this function is on the space. Okay. So note F tilde is on the space. And if I do f tilde z plus i, then that would be just f of z plus i, which by assumption is on the space because I'm taking an f in the domain. So this is also on the space. So f tilde is on the domain. And moreover, f doesn't vanish in f tilde at w plus i is not zero. Okay, so if we had a function that vanished at the w plus i, we could remove that zero. So if we go back to this inequality here, I can definitely do it for f tilde, okay? And therefore, this guy won't be zero, but under the assumption that this is zero, it means that this is zero. Then using the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality for f equals f tilde, we get that ew minus i has to be equal to ew plus i, because this bit here has to be zero. Okay. But then we can use the identity The identity says that this bit here is E star of W. Okay, so then we conclude that E W plus I equals E star of W, but E star of W is just W bar W, okay? Well, so W plus I, and now is the final conclusion. W is in here. W plus I will be a point in here. And maybe W bar will be a point in here. So W, W, W plus I and W are points in the upper half plane. If they are distinct, then we have a problem. Because if they are in the same uh, vertical line. So since Since W bar and W plus I belong to the upper half plane and have the same real part, and E is of Poya class, then so you have so the function is non decreasing. But you're saying that there is two points where the absolute value is equal. It's actually, the function is actually equal. Uh, and this is a problem in the book. Uh, let me see what problem it is. I think it's uh, problem 15. So problem 15 will say that E of Z, let me just double check. I think it's an exponential. Yeah, E has to be some exponential for some H real, okay? That means if the function is not strictly decreasing, uh, increasing in this direction, it's not strictly increasing, uh, then it has to be this form. But it can't be of this form because, well, it has some zeros to start with, and also this won't satisfy the functional identity we have. Okay. Um, and so this is a, a contradiction. Um, no, sorry, not, not a contradiction. So that means that these points cannot be distinct, because if they were distinct, it would be a contradiction. 
then W bar has to be equal to W plus I, which again is to say that uh, imaginary part of W equals minus a half. Okay. And again, if the imaginary part equals minus a half, then you have this. Okay. And moreover, just to finish the result, also note, we even finish here, but you still have to prove the part that the assertion that the zeros have to be simple, but this is in here. Well, if the thing was a strictly, a strictly uh, uh, positive whenever you had a non-zero function, that would mean that this bit here is strictly positive. So the real part of this thing is strictly positive, okay? And then, so this thing here uh, is non-zero because it's real part is strictly positive. So, so this bit here is non-zero, or this is non-zero because this point uh, here is not in the strip. So therefore this is non-zero. So the zero is simple. Okay, so if you had strictly positivity whenever you have a non-zero function, that would automatically imply that the zero is simple. So that finishes the proof. Any questions here? Okay. So I find this a very nice Proof. If I was the prince, so the prince did this just after he showed the peep and bar conjecture so, and was with a remarkable proof. So if I did this at the same time, I would probably think that, oh, okay, I solved the Riemann hypothesis. I just have to show that this can be used for the zeta function. That there is a standard way of doing, of setting E uh, as a function related with the the zeta function. Uh, so I would think the same way as he did. And, but it turns out that by some tiny uh, detail, uh, um, it is not true. Okay, you can't use this approach to solve the, the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, and that's what I want to talk right now. So let me maybe see. Okay. okay, so um so what is the zeta function? Well, I already told you in another class a bit about the zeta function, but let me just we call you. So that's the zeta function. We know, so that means draw the typical picture is x, then it's y. That's the line, it's one, that's zero. And we have the three to zeros here, which would be the even integers. And then here we have a pole. And then all the zeros, non-trivial zeros lie in this line, in this strip. And the RH is that all the zeros are in this line. Um, and we defined the C function associated, which was a half um, S, S minus one, pi minus S over two, gamma S over two, and zeta of S. By doing that, you extend your function as this entire function of order one, uh, meaning that we have a specific specific Hadamard factorization, and all the zeros of this new function will be in this strip. Uh, so this is e to the s product of is it c of zero and then one minus zeta over rho. And rho in this class will always denote the zero of the function you're working with. And 
and this b is just the sum is is just the sum of it's minus the sum of the real parts of one of the whole. Um, so this one's what we did in the class where we talked about bounding the zeta function on the critical line. Um, but I want to do that also for L functions. So I just want to recall some things. Um, so if you have, if C, this is, So if key is a Dirichlet character, then we can define the associated L function like this. In a Dirichlet character, there are several ways of defining what it is. If you go to Wikipedia, there's a bunch of ways. Um, one way to see is just, is a periodic, there is a recorder that you only have to see what the model is, model Q. That means it's a Q periodic function over the integers um, with some special properties. One bit which I like to see is that is the is eigenfunction of the discrete Fourier transform. Um, but there are other ways of defining it. Let me just recall what they are. So recall, if you haven't seen this thing before, so a Dirichlet character initially is just a character defined over the multiplicative group, modulo Q. So you get the residue classes modulo Q, so let's say one to Q, and you remove those ones which don't belong to the multiplicative structure and it's just a totally multiplicative uh, function. And then we extend that guy to the whole integers and we extend key to the natural number say starting with one to dot 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 uh, by just by restriction by uh, q of n equals let's say q of n let's say mod is let me see just by restriction. We just take, so Q of N uh, uh, well, is initially, initially only defined here, but then you define in the whole re residue class, just including zeros, uh, where it was, wasn't defined before. And then you have a vector of size Q, and then you just uh, translate that vector and fill the whole uh, natural numbers. And so that will be Q periodic, and that will be your Dirichlet character. So that's what I mean by restriction. Okay. Um, so uh, so let me just recall some denomination. So key. Usually we use this key zero uh, subscript is principal. Is Q of n is principal means that they only assume value is one. Okay, so it's equal to one if n. Uh, so this is the notation for the greatest common divisor between n and q is one. So if n is prime, so BB should introduce the notation. So if n is co prime with q. Of course, the multiplicative group would be those guys which are co-primed with the, with the given modulus. Uh, and the principle means that it's just one in all those guys. And Q is called induced uh, if 
there is a mod, let's say Q tilde mod A, uh, where A divides Q. And Q equals just the Q2 that times the principal character. So it means that basically a deuced character is that it's not actually Q periodic, it has a, some small period. That's the way of thinking. And you have a, some small period, so well, I shouldn't be really considering that guy. So if it's not induced, Q is called primitive. So basically, that's that's the, the, the nomenclature you see. You have either the principal one, which is just a bunch of ones, and you have uh, the primitive ones, which are like basically the true the Dirichlet characters model Q, because the ones which are not primitive, they are constructed by other characters from uh, residue classes, lower residue classes. So they are not really the guys we want to pay attention. So primitive and principal, that's, these are the the ones, uh, the, the two names that people usually use. Okay. So for instance, the zeta function would be for Q equals two, would be the principal, uh, principal, no, Q equals one, I guess. Okay. Yeah, Q equals one, I guess. Anyway, the, 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 the zeta function will be one of these guys. So whenever you have a, a, a primitive Dirichlet character, you have a Euler product. So what's the Euler product? I'm just recalling some facts here. And whenever you have a digital cracker, you have a, a, a on a product, which also works only for the trivial part. The vast greater than one, something I forgot to say about zeta as well. And these, these absolute convergence usually is only in this bit, but you can put zero if you don't ask for absolute convergence and the character is not principal then you can actually go up to zero. Uh, but anyway, usually, it usually is bigger than one. Uh, and what we know, we do by the other product. So L of S of C doesn't have zeros. Is the real part of S greater than one. Okay. And you can also show that turns out to be equivalent to the statement that the uh, uh, well, with the prime number theorem for primes in arithmetic progressions, um, one can show that L of one plus I T of key is different than zero for every T real. So, so if you go to the drawing, what I'm saying is that there are no zeros in here. And by the functional equation, we will see in a moment, there won't be any zeros in here. And then we also have what? Um, yes, and then we also have the functional equation. What's the functional equation? Well, it, it will depend. Uh, so if the character is even or odd. So if Q is primitive, non-principal, then um, then you define Q of S of C as Q over pi S plus A over two, and then gamma S plus A over two, L of S key, 
and A is A equals one if Q minus one is one, that means the character is even because this would is equivalent to say that Q of N uh, equals Q minus N. Um, minus n in the sense of the, the, the residue classes. And then minus one is q minus one equals minus. No, this is zero, sorry. One is the guy, the guy is odd. So bottom line, you have to put the one here if you have an odd derivative character. And in since it's non-principle, we won't have a, a, a pole at this point here. So we won't have these uh, factors S, S, and S minus one. We won't need them. Okay. So define this guy like this, then you know that like C of S equals this guy, C1 minus S star. We star in the sense that the star operation we, we, we usually do, like bar, bar. But this, maybe the, the classical, maybe it's better to write. The classical one is this, but this is equal to just to say the same thing, which would be more convenient to us because. So now you can see that, well, really nice because this is more or less what we had before. This is the function star at one minus at something equals the function here. Before it was z minus i instead of a real translation, it was a complex translation, but one can be mapped into the other by a, a rotation and a translation. So that's the functional equation, great. What else I want to show? And then by this functional equation, one can show that, well, if it's an even character, then uh, you have this, then the function L has this trivial zeros as the zeta has the even numbers. And if the character is odd, then we'll have the odd numbers here as, as trivial zeros. Uh, so a bunch of similarities, but the bottom line is that now all the zeros of k r n. Also the functional equation rule out zeros with a uh, real part uh, equals zero. Okay, and they'll so the generalized Riemann hypothesis for Dirichlet characters, the yeah, Dirichlet L functions is a statement that all the zeros of these guys are also in the line I have. Okay. Any questions here in this in this stuff? Okay. Uh, another maybe. Well, what if, what if the character is principal? What happens? Uh, well, if it's principal, then it will be the zeta times some, some uh, factor, some product, finite product of some factors, then if, if the character is principal, then you can reduce the problem to study the zeta function. That's why we don't uh, deal with principles in terms of finding functional equations. Um, and if it's, if it's non-primitive, then you can reduce it. So it will be induced by a bunch of other characters, then you can reduce its L function or its C function to a bunch of other uh, uh, L functions and C functions of the each one of the, the characters, you know, the, the composition of the characters. So, so that's why we don't use uh, um, primitive ones. We don't bother with them. So the theorem that I want to show now, which should be theorem interrogation plus one, Uh, is the following, the function C um, 
okay the function c has this um oh no let me just i don't want to prove that let me just recall so the other thing i want to recall is the hadamard factorization of these functions. These functions happen to be functions of order one. So it will have a Hardamar factorization similar as the one of the zeta function. Did I put zeta? Something else just remember this PS. So it's similar to the zeta function and the B has the same expression because the B can be easily deduced from this. If you use the functional equation, so this equals that, and then well, you have a functional equation like C and you substitute the functional equation, this product formula, and then you can, you take the log derivative of both sides and then that easily gives you the expression for B. Okay, so B is also minus the sum of the real parts of one over O. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the Hadamard factorization. So what the theorem I want to prove is that theorem. So that should be interrogation plus one. Is that if I define E of Z let me remove the dependency of on C for the moment. Let me just define it like this. So this is the rotation I was talking about. Do this rotation that this function here is of prior class. Okay. And it's also a, a mid pillar. Okay. So you can already see that, okay, so this is a function. And well, this function has a zero, of course. So, um, so this is a function that I can apply the result. And that was what the branch was thinking about. Okay, and this is actually really simple to show because proof. Because if you do, this, that means I want to know if the function is increasing in the x-axis when, when I go in vertical line in the, sorry, in the upper half of plane. This is usual, a usual computation we do. This is equal to that. Uh, but this is also equal to uh, the real part of C bar of S divided by C of S, let me lose the dependence on, 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 on the variable key, on the character key here, it will be implicit. And S here is one minus RZ, okay? So that's what we need to show. We need to show, uh, and, and well, I'm assuming, let's say imaginary part of Z, positive, which is the same to say that the real part of S is greater than one. Okay, so in a sense, the, the C function already was a Poya in the Poya class. If you rotate the Poya class, instead of using the upper half plane, you use that semi space as the definition for your Poya class. Um, so in that sense, the C the C function would be a Poya class. So just going back to what we used to, which is uh, in the upper half plane. Okay. So that is actually simple to do because once you do the log derivative, um, that would be what? If I just use its Hadamard uh, expansion, that would be B plus sum of one over S minus whole plus one over whole. So if I do the real part, B is real. So I don't need to do that. I already know the real part of that. But B is 
this minus the sum of your parts of the inverses of the zero. So this bit and this bit will cancel. So you only get the sum of the real parts of this, which will be then the real part of S minus rho divided by S minus rho squared. Okay, but S, the real part of S is greater than one and rho is a zero of the zeta of the C function. So it's on the strip. So you're doing a value this minus something in here. So this is definitely positive. Okay, because rho, if we go back to the strip, rho is a point in here and you, rho is a point in here and S is a point in here. So you're doing this minus this and take the real part. That's going to be positive. Okay, so great. It's non is actually increasing if I go up. Uh, I don't have zeros in the lower, uh, in the upper half plane, because this transformation here, as you could already imagine, this let me draw it. This transformation here sends the zero one sends an S, sends to zero minus I in Z, okay? So since I don't have zeros in here, I don't have zeros in the upper half plane as well. Great, all the zeros in the lower half plane. So now I just need to show that is a Hermit pillar that we have that inequality. And then we can show just turn by turn. And then to show, and then we'll point out as an exercise. Uh, use Hadamard factorization. And then I will even uh, write it in a better way. The better way would be to use this fact here. And using this fact there, you can put this P inside and then you can get just and um, so that would be E to S is I times the imaginary part of one over who. Because the other part we cancel would be. So you only have that. Okay, so if you use this and then prove that E is in P, HP. So, so you do the transformation, you send S to one minus I, Z, replacing this, this thing and then do term by term. Yeah, this term won't affect anything because of this I here. And this one would just be, well, it's, it would be just a polynomial and it will be a polynomial. Once you transform it to Z, it will be a polynomial with a zero here, which we know is a mid pillar. So everything will work fine. Okay, so that would finish the result. Any questions here so far? Great. So now we come to the final part of the class, which is the big surprise. So, okay, so now we can apply uh, the theorem to E of Z equals C of let me call it notation one minus i z for d to correct on one principle. We could also apply for the zeta function. I, I, I did this only 
Okay, I have to tell here. So, um, oh, this, this works in general. Uh, yes, this works in general, but uh, what I'm saying that this, this, this proof here doesn't assume that the, if the character is primitive or, or whatever, um, but I do need the functional equation and the functional equation will only work if it's primitive and unprincipled. So it means that with the functional equation, oh, maybe I have to remark that. So now I can apply the theorem if he is a primitive and non-principled. Because, oh, the functional equation If this functional equation is not completely correct, I should put, well, first of all, I have to explain what is this. Nobody said anything. Um, let me just put it some W here and uh, in W remove this thing here. Uh, where W here is it the key hat of one uh, if Q of minus one is one or W is excuse me, shouldn't say that. Let me put let's say one. Lambda is uh, I, he had of one. If he had of minus one equals minus one. Okay, and he had of one is the Fourier transform of he evaluated at the point one. I don't want to define that. Uh, uh, the point, the most important bit is that the model I of W equals one. So let me base where uh, model i of w equals one. And let me put that as a comment. Okay. That's the important bit. It's some number of model, model is one. Uh, because, well, the functional equation so the functional equation, uh, equation for C uh, implies a functional equation for E, implies that E star of Z equals some, let's say, uh, probably lambda is here, E of Z minus I, which was exactly as before. Well, we had this lambda, but we can get rid of it pretty easily uh, uh, because uh, because if you just define e tilde of z, say equal to uh, lambda minus a half e of z, then. then E tilde star of Z equals what? We'll have to do conjugate here, but this guy is a number of modulo one. So it will be just this. Okay. But this is lambda minus a half E of Z minus I by the previous identity. But that's exactly the definition of a tilde of z minus i, okay. So we can then apply the result to this guy. So this lambda here doesn't present any problem. So we could apply the result. Whenever you have a primitive non-principal character, we could do it. The same, uh, the same is true if I use the zeta function. So or if e of z 
equals C of S, which is a half S, S minus one. So, we could apply the theorem to a Dirichlet character, non-principal, uh, primitive, or either the, the principal one uh, for the zeta function. Because we had the hard domain factorization for any permit for any Dirichlet character, and we have the function that we, uh, equation, if it's non-principal and primitive, or if it's the, the, the zeta function. But it turns out that we can't, because the condition, the, the only condition left to test, let me go back to the results. Yeah, so this bit is okay, no real zeros also okay, because that means that there is no zeros on the line a real particle zero and on the vertical line real particle one. But that is okay as well. We do have this functional equation. Then the only thing to test is if the operator that do this shift by plus i is accurate and it is not. And the reason why it's not is crazy. Um, let me see, yes, the last page. So we call, we call that above all, we deduced that if the condition was true, then the real part of E prime of W, E of W minus I bar divided by two pi I, is greater than or equal to zero. So let's say just divided by i to make it simple. If e w <clears throat> is zero. Okay, so it turns out that for the zeta case. Oh, I didn't do the, the thing. So it turns out that for the zeta case, uh, uh, well, okay, before I say this, uh, well, this guy here, is actually just uh, minus the real part of C, let me drop the, the key index is just, oh yeah, it's just, um, so this was bar, um, so this was bar, so this was not bar. Well, let me take a look. There is some, uh, yeah, I have some, some mistake here. Let me take a look. Um, what do you do here? Okay, it's minus. Yes, minus key bar, and this is one plus whole. Yes. Let's see four. Another one. Yeah, I don't think there is even like this. Yeah, you do the calculation and it should be this. It should be with the bar here. Yeah, but if we follow the people exactly, there is, there, there is no bar. Maybe it's using the functional equation. I mean, you do the computation and you realize that this is this. 
Okay. So basically what, what this is saying that if the condition holds, this would be greater or equal than zero. And basically what I'm doing here is that what well, W is a zero V, but these are the zeros also of, these are the zeros also of, zeros also of uh, the C function. So anyway, so what happens for the zeta function? Uh, one, one question. Yes. Um, the rho in this equation, is it one minus WI or is it? Um, like on the right hand side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just copy it from the paper. Let's, so let's work it out. So E of Z is what? C of one minus I Z. So E prime should be this prime times minus I. And then E of W minus I should be what? It should be C of one minus I, W minus I. So this should be what? This should be C of, well, this is contributing with a minus minus. So this is minus I, W, I guess. No? Um, yes, minus I, W. Uh, yes, but this is minus one. Yes, yeah, so we cancel with the one here. And uh, what we can do is write this as C of one plus IW. Well, okay, maybe that's what you're doing because I have to put bar in here. Yeah, so that would be what? That would be C of of what star I guess of W bar no sorry of I W bar and a do bar I get a minus and a do bar again yeah so that would be C of one minus I W bar. Modulo, uh, multiplying some uh, constant here. Uh, so, okay, so suppose that this is the case then uh, so W should be one minus I, sorry, um, S should be one minus I Z. So Ho should be one minus, um, so if W is a zero, then Ho should be one minus I W. So this guy should be, yeah, so if I put W here. So this guy would be minus I C bar whole, that bar bit looks good. And this bit is C of one. Okay, now I see. So this guy here, so well the zeros, okay, so this is one minus I W, but W is something like a half plus I T. So one minus I a half plus I T bar, that will be one minus I a half minus I T, which will be what? It will be, um, wait, this is looking weird. Oh no, W is not that, sorry. Uh, w is yes, w is a zero v. W is minus 
W is T minus I over two. Okay, I want to write this in terms of whole. That's, that's what I want, sorry. So how can I write this? It here. Let's see if that's completely correct. It looks like. Um, how can I write this? So this would be what? This would be the whole. One plus four. This can't be one plus four. Well, let me make a better fix so we don't get this. I mean, in the paper, they write it exactly like this, that this quantity equals that. But uh, maybe it's a mistake that we, I don't really care. Oops, what it is. This has to be greater or equal than zero. That's the important bit, okay? So if you go to zeta, so you have all the zeros. So now the zeros are rotated, but anyway. Well, and you get, if you go to zeta and you get W, W equals, let's say, W24, which is a 24 zero is starting from, so this is the Y axis and this is the X axis. So there is a zero here, there is a zero there, et cetera. And you go to the 34 zero. Is it the 34? Yes, the 34. Then you evaluate this quantity here. So I don't want to do that. Then, I mean, all this, this, these things are computable in terms of say, you can, as I was trying to do, but I don't want to do it now because whenever I do something, some calculation live, I tend to make a mistake. And uh, this is minus 0.538 dot 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 times 10 to the minus 69 and therefore less than zero. And if you, so you, unfortunately the condition doesn't hold and it's just by a tiny bit, this is 10 to the minus 69. If you, okay, maybe it works for some other character. If you go to key four, which is the character one zero minus one zero modulo four. This will be the, its values. And then you repeat that periodically. Um, and then you, you, you take your, your guy real part of the um, uh, W key, oh, this is prime. And then you go to some other W minus I bar for this key four divided by i and you take one of the zeros i don't know which one this is one, one of the zeros you don't, you don't have to go much higher it's something like the so this is 34 i said 34 and you go 24. you have to go something like around 50 zeros i don't know this is minus 2.31 times 10 to the power 45, and therefore less than zero, okay? So it doesn't work for the zeta because of this reason, this guy, and it doesn't work for key four, okay? And all these quantities here are simple to compute. If you even go to the paper, there is the mathematical code, you can just copy and paste and, and test it. Um, Oh, granted, you have to use some high precision, but I mean, the, the softwares nowadays can do that easily. And you don't have it. And then you even remember that testing myself for other characters and then always getting something negative. Um, so um, unfortunately, you can't do it this way, and, but it's by a tiny amount. Um, um, so I guess if this conjecture, if, if the branch was born in like in the 800s, uh, 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 1800, sorry, like that, but, and then like say uh, 
then the people wouldn't have these kind of uh, new softwares, then people would definitely think that this, this was the right approach. Um, anyway, any, any questions here before we finish? Okay, so uh, I hope you enjoyed this class. It was uh, nice in the beginning and like a, uh, not so nice in the end, but that's life. That's like an example of what mathematics is. If even if it looks like you have the right approach, doesn't mean you have the right approach. And this is uh, sadly like the reality of the day, every day of a mathematician always looks like you're doing something right. Turns out it's completely wrong. Anyway, I hope you enjoy and see you next time.